Hello, everybody, and welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. I am John Schmoke, joined by Matthew Sytak, and we'll take a lot of your calls today, folks, at 201-939-4513. So a weird week here at the facility because it's a Thursday, but it's a player's day off. And this is what they do uh, week one of the year, and they also do this coming off of the bye week where they have the players in here working on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, off Thursday. Then they have work tomorrow, kind of their Friday walkthrough type of practice, and then they'll have their game uh, on Sunday. And it's just weird, Matt, being around here on a Thursday and not having anything going on. It's a little strange. Yeah, I mean, today's the day normally where Giants coordinators speak. We have Coach Dable's little, like, flyby with the media, practice, players, and... We got none of it today. No, we do not. Um, we did do it yesterday, though, so it's not like it ha did not happen at all. But, yeah, it is a little weird that we're, you know, this close to game day and nothing going on today. Yeah, and um, on the Giants Little Podcast, you guys should go check it out, by the way, on the Giants Podcast Network podcast feed. I interviewed uh, Matthew Collar uh, this morning. He covers the Vikings for Purple Insider, kind of one of their independent guys that covers them. And he told me a couple interesting things about the Vikings that I thought would be a good kickoff point talking about today's show. Let's hear it. One, he thinks Jordan Addison is going to be good to go. Uh, he seemed like he was moving pretty well yesterday, and he said unless there's a setback, you expect that he is going to play. Uh, Josh Naylor is the only other player on the injury report. He's the other third wide receiver. He is questionable. Wasn't as quite as sure about him, but he expects Addison to play. So that's, that's number one. Also, talking to him about what this offense might look like with Sam Darnold, right? Because we know how Kevin O'Connell wants to run his offense when he is Kirk Cousins. And I asked him flat, I go, well, Matt, do you think this Vikings offense is going to be, all right, Vikings offense, remove Kirk Cousins, insert Sam Darnold. And he says, I don't think so. Talking to him, a big focus of the Vikings' offseason was going to be running the football better. And he thinks they're going to try to lean into that run game with Aaron Jones a lot more. They replaced Ezra Cleveland. He was traded midseason last year, if you remember. They brought in uh, Blake Brendel as a big, hulking, 320-pound, 6'7 guard. So they're going to try to lean into, I think, more of a power running game here, Matt. And I think try to take some of the pressure, based on what he's saying, off of Sam Darnold with their run game a little bit more than maybe we've seen the last couple of years, when the Vikings' run game, frankly, has been one of the least efficient in football. Yeah, and that makes sense with one of the moves they all made this offseason. They went out and signed veteran running back Aaron Jones. Uh, it was just a one-year deal. It wasn't, you know, huge money, but given where the running back market has been, I would say the last couple of years, it wasn't nothing either. So it seems clear that they had some big plans for Aaron Jones, and that starts with, you know, obviously running the ball and doing it quite often. Uh, as you mentioned, that – will 100% help take some of the pressure off of Sam Darnold. You know, we've we've heard a lot about what Sam Darnold is going to be this year for the Vikings, you know, especially since J.J. McCarthy went down with the season-ending knee injury. And I, for one, think Sam Darnold is going to have a good year. Me too. I mean, and part of it is because I truly believe, and I said this to you on the show on Monday, I think Kevin O'Connell is just one of the best offensive play callers in the NFL. And I think he's just going to be able to – create or not create but implement his system and you know sort of set sam Darnold up for success put him in situations where you know he's not going to have to make a ton of very difficult throws you know it's going to be more easy throws and you know short routes he'll take the occasional you know shots down the field but i don't think it's going to be an overly complicated system for sam Darnold to run and you know sam Darnold did not really play last year he started one game yep. He was the backup for Brock Purdy in San Francisco, but Kyle Shanahan and Kevin O'Connell, those two are connected. You know, they run similar schemes. So it's not like he's brand new to this either. He had a full year of learning under Kyle Shanahan, who might be even better than Kevin O'Connell when it comes to offensive play calling. I certainly think he is. He might be the best in the league. But they're two, I think they're two of the best. So I do think Sam Darnold is going to be, you know, a lot better than some people out there seem to think, especially like those in the media. I see. People being like, oh, Sam Darnold, you know, look what he did the the first five, what, six years of his career. What's he going to do now? The Vikings are going to stink. But I really don't think that's going to be the case. Well, I'm going to throw some stats out there that I sent to you guys yesterday. I was taking a look at this, and I actually got this off of um, what motivated me to look at it is on the Athletic Football Show podcast. We had Robert Mays on the John Soto podcast earlier in the year, and they were going through some of the stuff with the Vikings. And 
as I joked on the show, I think it was with you earlier in the week, how I'm basically like Denzel Washington in the movie Unstoppable, and mm. I'm on the Sam Darnold train, and I'm taking it to the last stop. Like, I'm on it. I'm not getting off. If this thing crashes, I'm on it. If it, if it goes well, I'm on it. And I really think, and you kind of stopped short of using the word create, but I don't think you should have. I think Kevin O'Connell is going to create a lot of opportunities for him to hit open wide receivers. There's a reason he's one of the best coordinators in the league, right? Or one of the best play callers in the league, I should say. He's the head coach. And you have Justin Jefferson there, who if you single team him, Sam Darnold's just going to throw it to him every time. Yep. Which would be a great plan, by the way. (laughs) And if you're going to double team him, oh, then you have the guy you also used a first round pick on two years ago. That can probably be man-to-man coverage. Who scored 10 touchdowns as a rookie last year. Bingo. And was very. And if you look at his numbers and how they spiked after Justin Jefferson was out with you know that hamstring and then later on he had the chest injury, right, with, yep. um, with the bruised lung, that he can play well. Now, there's no TJ Hawkinson. That's going to hurt. He was kind of their underneath option last year. Who's going to be that underneath option this year? I don't know. They have Oliver and uh, Muntz as their two tight ends. Both mm. guys are more blockers, and he thinks they will go to more 12 personnel, run, play action out of 12. And the other thing that Collar told me, which I thought was interesting, was um, in the offseason, you saw, and I'm not surprised by this, in practice, in training camp, you saw a ton of Sam Darnold flashes, like, oh, man, that's a good pass. Wow, he's mobile. He's got a big arm. He can throw it down the field. And you're like, wow, this guy, you can see why teams keep giving him chances, why he was a you know top five pick in the draft. But he said, then you got to the joint practices. And then you saw, all right, well, he threw the ball in the traffic in the middle of the field a couple too many times. Some of those Sam Darnold things that have popped up over the course of his career. So his last stretch of starting games, Matt, was in 2022 with the Panthers. And he was a starter their final seven weeks of the year. They had one bye week in there, so it was six weeks for him. And when I go through the rankings, it'll be seven games for the other quarterbacks. In those six games, the Panthers went 4-2. and two. He was second in the NFL in EPA per dropback. That's expected points added. It's an advanced metric that takes a lot of things into consideration. Second in EPA per dropback behind only Jared Goff and slightly ahead of Patrick Mahomes. Pretty good. Pretty good. Number two in yards per attempt behind Tua during that same stretch. Threw the ball down the field a lot. Third in the NFL in percentage of dropbacks that yielded a first down or touchdown. That's a big, that because that shows you you're throwing beyond the sticks or you're yep. throwing it into the end zone, right? So it shows that you're getting the ball down the field and, you're, and your passes have a lot of worth and value to your team. Third in the percentage of dropbacks that yielded a first down or touchdown. And then he was 14th in completions of 20 or more yards during that trust. But again, one fewer game than a lot of other quarterbacks because of the late bye. So that probably would be in the top 10 if he had the same amount of games. The thing is that the counting stats weren't great because they didn't throw the ball a ton. So I'm trying to connect this stat here to what Collar told me on that Giants Total Podcast episode. Is that up yet, by the way, Pearson? It is. How I think they're probably going to try to limit his attempts have him in the mid-20s, run the ball of Aaron Jones, but I think there's going to be a lot of shots here. I think it's going to be a, when he throws it, it's going to be a lot of stuff down the field. Now, Shane Bowen's defense is designed to try to take a lot of that stuff away, but if the Vikings can run the ball well enough, and I talked to Shane about this off the podium yesterday, I sent you the audio, and I said, well, how do you calculate the pluses and minuses and your decision-making and how you handle Justin Jefferson. If you do a true double, if you do a safety over the top, do you do a bracket? Do you just play a man-on-man? He goes, look, well, yeah, you could do the safety over the top with a split safety, and you can do a bracket, but then your box is light, so they can attack you with the run. So I think a big part of this game, trying to bring everything full circle here, is can can they run the ball with Aaron Jones to force the Giants to get out of that safety over the top on Justin Jefferson that could yield some big plays down the field? So... All this stuff is connecting. It's going to be a big numbers game, I think, for the Giants' defense, Matt. How many guys do they have to put in the box? How many guys do they have to stay deep? My thought is that they're going to try to stop the run with their front seven or if they're a nickel front six first. Try to keep that guy over the top to prevent the explosive plays to Jefferson and Addison. Play quarters, play cover two, play cover three, things like that. Well, cover three, you can't bring the safety down. But... Make the Vikings get you out of that. And I think that's how I would handle it. 
make the Vikings force you to commit another person to the run. I'm not going to let those receivers and Darnold beat me down the field. And unless Jones is, you know, just gutting me again and again and again, which he's really good, it's possible, I would try to keep those safeties deep over the top. Yeah. I I mean, I agree, especially when you have a wide receiver as talented as Justin Jefferson. I mean, we've seen him make just some insane receptions since he came into the NFL, and he does it on a consistent basis. So, yeah, they probably they will take some shots to him because, quite honestly, all you need to do is throw the ball in his general vicinity, and there's a pretty good chance he's going to come down with it. Even if he's covered. Even if he's covered. Even if he's double teamed. We've You're seen right. him doing <laughs> countless times. You're not times. wrong. Um, but, yeah, I, I agree that, that, honestly, that should be the game plan because it's no surprise that the Giants struggled to stop the run last year. And they have for – it's been a couple seasons now that they've really struggled in that area. Now, I think – it's fair to say that that probably is a big reason why Shane Bowen is now the defensive coordinator here because absolutely his defenses with the Titans excelled against the run were one of the best I think all three years that he was there. Uh, so yes, I if I'm Minnesota, I'm trying to establish the run early and often, and if I'm the Giants, I'm making sure I you know I stop that run. Uh, and just in terms of what you said a little earlier about no T.J. Hawkinson. I wouldn't be surprised at all if if Aaron Jones is a decently big part of the passing game. Yeah, because he so is a very good pass catcher out of the backfield. Yeah, great call. And when you mentioned those two other tight ends on the team, I mean, no offense to those guys, they aren't that intimidating. And you have Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson on the outside, but you don't really have a a great, I would say, very reliable pass catcher. Otherwise, Aaron Jones fits that bill. So I wouldn't be surprised if they use him in sort of the the short passing game in replace of Hawkinson. Not this weekend, you know, until Hawkinson returns. I'm with you. I, I believe I And I think I said Josh Naylor before. I think he's a former NBA player, right? Josh Naylor, Josh Naylon. Was he like an NBA player in like I the early so. 2000s? Jalen Naylor, I apologize, okay. is that third wide receiver on the Vikings. Because they are they are shallow behind Jefferson and Addison, right? Yeah. Tristan Jackson, Trent Sherfield, you remember him from the Arizona Cardinals? And I don't remember where he was last year. Was he with the Rams last year, maybe, Trent Sherfield? I don't remember. He, I remember him from the Cardinals. And then you have Brandon Powell. Uh, so... These aren't exactly big names behind Jefferson and Addison, so I think you're really going to look to to try to back up the... Uh, oh, I think he was with the Dolphins last year, Sherfield, actually. Um, Bills. So, Bills, Dol too. Dolphins huh? the year before. Dolphins the year before. Oh, so he's been that long since he's been on the Cardinals? You see where he went to college, though? Oh, jeez, he's a Vandy guy? Vandy guy. Anchor down. All right, so now <laughs> if, if he now has Now you a, better watch out for him. So if he has a big game this week, <laughs> that is also going to be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> no question about it. Uh, look, they have a pretty good offensive line. I think the whole Garrett Bradbury, Dexter Lawrence, and we can switch now over to the defensive matchup here, I think, Matt. And we're trying to kind of – tomorrow we'll let Matt and Paul do like the full preview. I'm trying to kind of go inside the Vikings a little bit today to just dig into their team specifically. And the, uh, their tackles are good. Christian Darasaur and Brian O'Neill are two good quality tackles. Darasaur versus Brian Burns is going to be a fantastic matchup. He might hold Burns without a sack. That's how good Christian Darrisaw is. So I think where the Giants' advantage could could lay here is inside. We saw Dexter Lawrence against Garrett Bradbury two years ago. Did not go well for Garrett Bradbury. Nope. He's one of those 295-pound underside centers. It's not his fault. I mean, still, folks, just think if you had you got to try to stop a guy that weighs more than 50 pounds than you do. Good luck stopping that, dude. It's tough for any center in the NFL to slow down Dexter Lawrence. Let alone somebody that's sub-300 pounds. 100%. Yeah. And then their guards are not proven. I mentioned Blake Brandle. He's the new guy they brought in. And then Ed Ingram has been there a few years. Again, he's not a great pass protection guy. He's more of like a big, mauler type. So I think the Giants, if Bowen can, you know, get Dexter in some one-on-ones inside, maybe run some games and run some loopers in there, I think that they can take advantage of the interior of that Vikings offensive line just a little bit. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we've been talking for months since the trade for Brian Burns, how between Brian Burns, Dexter Lawrence, and Kayvon Thibodeau, you just can't double-team them all. You just can't. They're not enough blockers on the field for you. Well, my guess is they're going to double-team Dex in this game, and they're going to trust their tackles, right? Yeah. I mean, I would honestly, that's what I would do. I think you have to. And I, I would take my chances with that. I mean, I know you, you just mentioned how – those two tackles are good, and they definitely are. I mean, just look at the contract that the Vikings gave Christian Derrissaw this offseason. They clearly believe he is their franchise tackle. 
but I'm going to, you know, trust Brian Burns and Kayvon in these one-on-one situations. I mean, we during the preseason, we only got a glimpse of it, but I keep referring back to that uh, the first half of that Houston Texans game, especially in that goal-to-go situation, that fourth down play in particular where Brian Burns just put a nasty spin move on the tackle, got right by him and right immediately into the face of C.J. Stroud, who had no choice but to quickly get rid of it, right into the hands of Dexter Lawrence, who batted it down on fourth down and caused a turnover on down. So, yeah. so you're right. If I'm the Vikings, I am double teaming Dexter Lawrence because that is definitely between their five offensive linemen, the toughest matchup for them in the interior. And if I'm the Giants, I'm perfectly happy with that. I'm going to trust Burns and Kayvon to hit home and do what, you know, they both were brought here to do. That's why you trade and pay for Brian Burns. Yeah. That's why you draft Kayvon Thibodeau in the top 10. So if you get single teams, you expect them to win. And while those two tackles we've talked about, Darisaw and O'Neal, they definitely are good. They both had their moments last year where they kind of, I would say, struggled a little bit. I no, mean, absolutely. I think they both, I think I checked this morning, they both were down for like six sacks allowed on the season, which is not awful, but it's also not, you know, Amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, six, six for an offensive tackle is solid, but it isn't like all pro Andrew Thomas level exactly. tackle play. Yeah. Correct. I'm with you on that. All right. Let's flip over now to the Vikings defense here. And the other thing Collar told me again, which I thought was interesting. Again, find that interview in the John Settle podcast. We also on that episode, by the way, have a fantastic interview um, with a analyst that really goes deep in on Shane Bowen's defense. He's worked in that defense as before as a coach. So he really kind of gets into the nuts and bolts of everything Shane Bowen tries to do on defense. It's a really good interview. Um, I cannot stress enough that that you guys should go check that out. Um, really interesting. I did the interview last Friday. Uh, we do a little bit specifically. Um, Cody Alexander. Yep, yeah, Cody Alexander from MatchQuarters.com. And check that out. It's awesome. Like you get more detail, and Pearson can attest to this on what Bowen does defensively, positioning, moving guys, stopping the run, blitzes. Everything is in there. It's really good. Cody goes in depth. So if you really want to know what to expect from the Giants' defense, go check that out in the Giants' little podcast. So, um, the Vikings' defense now. The thing that Collar told me I thought was interesting, Matt, is he thinks because they have, in his opinion, is better talent on defense, adding Stephon Gilmore oh, sure. at corner. Um, they did lose Daniel Hunter, which is a big loss for them. Dallas, but they, Dallas Turner. They bring in Dallas Turner, and they bring in Grenard, too, yeah. as a free agent in the offseason, right? He thinks he's still going to do Brian Flores things, you know, drop eight, stack the line, bring eight, sometimes drop, you know, show blitz, then bail out of it, all those sorts of things to confuse a quarterback. But he doesn't think it's going to be as crazy because he doesn't have to be as crazy. Andrew Van Ginkle is another guy they had in the offseason. Oh, yeah. He was with the Miami because they have better talent on that side of the ball. Yeah, I mean, that is for sure. We just discussed some of the players that they brought in. And, you know, Daniil Hunter, certainly that is a big loss. But if you're going to replace him with just about anyone in the draft, Dallas Turner is probably one of the best, if not the best guys you could replace him with. Yeah. And they brought in Stefan Gilmore just a couple of weeks ago, which, you know, it's not – I would say it's not always the greatest when it's two weeks before the end of training camp and you're just bringing a guy in for the first time. And signing him, we've all and been then there. Expecting him to, you know, start right away. Hello, Adore Jackson. <laughs> Hello, Adore Jackson is right. But if there is one guy, type of guy that you're confident in being able to do that, it's a longtime NFL veteran who has just proven to be one of one of the best at his position for almost a decade now. And it's funny. So the Vikings, they played more cover zero last year than any other team. They're almost at thirteen percent. Guess who was second? Giants. Correct. At 10.1% with with, with with Wig Martindale. But if you take the cover zero out of it, the Vikings played less cover one than any other team in the league last year. They were almost exclusively a zone team when they weren't in that cover zero situation. But with a guy like Gilmore, Byron Murphy, solid cornerback. Yep. Shaq Griffin's been a veteran in this league for a long time. I think they probably feel a little bit better about that. So you'll probably, I think you'll see a little bit more man to man. And it's funny, last year, like they never rushed four guys. They either rushed three or they rushed six or five, right? I think we'll see a little bit more of a standard NFL distribution of rushers and corners because, again, the, uh, the talent is just a little bit better. Yeah. And we haven't even mentioned Harrison Smith at safety, who's been in Minnesota forever now and is, you know, one of the most consistent players at his position, I think, in the NFL. He just year after year gets the job done. Yeah. 
he's very good. So yeah, they they certainly have a lot of talent there. I think this week one matchup is going to be a fantastic first test for the Giants offensive line, the new look offensive line, because as Brian Dable spoke about this two days ago, this is a pressure defense. They are going to come at you, come at you often with a lot of guys. And this will be a great first test to see, I guess, how much of a jump that this offensive line really has taken since last year. And not even necessarily, Matt, a jump physically. It's the mental jump, right? Oh, yeah. The setting the rules, passing guys off, understanding who's coming and who's not based on formation and tendencies, right? And just trusting that group of veterans to communicate and be aligned to handle some of these alignments, overloads, all those types of things that the Vikings do to try to screw you up. It's their job to make sure they keep Daniel in a good spot. They communicate with Daniel. And it's a big game for Daniel mentally, too, to work with the offensive line to get all that settled. So I'm with you. You know, Brian Dable's talked all off season, And, you know, he's always one to maybe not express confidence is the wrong word, but he's never one that tries to go over the top and praising anyone and keeps everything level. I mean, he hasn't been shy about saying what a difference having all these veterans on the offensive line have been. I mean, he's been pretty open about that. And I think... To your point, if you're ever going to get a better test than this Vikings pressure defense, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned this. The communication is going to be, the, I think, the most important aspect of their success on Sunday. Because, as you said, they disguise a lot of their blitzes. They try to confuse the quarterback, the offensive line. So having the five starting offensive linemen be able to communicate and be on the same page is going to be crucial. And, you know, of course, it's not ideal I would say that the starting five offensive linemen really only got all on the field together. I think it was last week for the first time. But on the flip side of that, outside of John Michael Schmitz, all four other starters, these are veteran guys that have been around the league for a while and know what they're doing. Yeah. And even Andrew Thomas in the locker room yesterday when asked about that said, we're, we're good. You know, all of these guys have been here long enough been around the league long enough where we were able to get up to speed we're all on the same page like we're ready to go and i think that is going to be you know crucial to how they that unit in particular performs on sunday yeah and i think it helps matt even though they haven't all been together and then we'll get to your calls coming up next year andrew thomas has been next to john runyon for the better part of you know the last three or four weeks i know runyon has been injured a little bit but even before the injury, Runyon at that point had moved to left guard for a bit. So they had worked together enough, I think, where they I feel good about them working together. Yep. And then you have Illuminor and Van Roten on the other side who have history working together with this offensive line coach in Vegas. So I don't worry about those guys necessarily working together well. And Runyon was next to Schmitz for the first, you know, well, then Schmitz got hurt. I wonder how many practices Runyon actually had next to Schmitz. I think their injuries did not overlap a ton. They did also have the spring, though. They had, no, you know, no, they had, that's a great point. They did have the spring. That's a really good point. So they did have the spring there. So the guys in like their little pods have had opportunities to kind of work together, even if they have not been on the field uh, altogether at the five time, uh, at, at the same time. All right, I'm very happy. I'm going to have to read this two more times. Here we go. Giants Fan Fest on Friday. Free and open to the public. It will take place on Friday, September 6th, presented by Wendy's MetLife Stadium. Doors opening at 5 p.m. We'll celebrate 100 seasons of Giants football with a ceremony honoring the top 100 Giants, autographs and panel discussions by Giants legends, historic displays, photos with the Lombardi trophies, and an incredible drone light and fireworks show to end the night. Get your tickets now by visiting Giants.com slash FanFest. Then the next morning, you can run or walk with Giants legends. The Giants Foundation will host a 5K race and kids run presented by Quest on Saturday, September 7th, 9 a.m. MetLife Stadium, and their proceeds will benefit the Giants Foundation. Everyone participating will receive a commemorative t-shirt, and after the race, stay for a festival with appearances by Giants Legends and a live DJ. Register now at Giants.com slash 5K. Guys, the Fan Fest is going to be off the hook awesome. I've seen videos of the drone show and firework show that's going to take place after the thing. It's really cool, and they have like audio and music to go along with it. It's very highly produced. It's, it's going to be really really good i've seen uh they've been working hard on that audio back in the back with uh one of our top men making sure everything gets uh edited there properly mr <laughs> mr rob browning all over that um so that's that also want to remind everybody that big blue kickoff live is back on saturdays on wfan set your alarms baby uh we'll be an hour this year last year only a half an hour we were at nine o'clock well we're an hour this year but 
the penance I had to pay for the hour show was to go from 7 to 8 a.m. So if you're up early Saturday mornings, you're an early riser, you're driving around, uh, Big Blue Kickoff Live, myself, Sean Morash, will be live on the fan uh, at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning. Uh, make sure you check that out. Um, I have a little interview with Eli Manning that will be appearing on that show as well as the radio pregame uh, on Sunday. So make sure you go check that out as well. All right. I've been keeping the callers holding long enough at 201-939-4513. And again, Matt will be with Paul tomorrow, and they'll do the full diagnostic preview of uh, Giants and Vikings getting ready for Sunday. All right, let's go to Wilson and Roxbury. He's going to lead us off today. Wilson, let's get us off to a good start here, brother. Hey, oh, uh, well, hey, Danny, I think I'm going to bring my A game. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't you sound very me? confident with that first word out of your mouth, but I'll, I'll, well, go ahead, Wilson. You know, I trust I, you. I, I, I thank you. Go Listen, ahead. What do you got? Um, uh, uh, on the game, I got a couple of things, but on the game, the only thing I'm going to say on the game is this. It's going to sound crazy, but I say crazy stuff all the time. Uh, That's true. <laughs> I don't care if they got to go. Well, I don't care if they got to go. Uh, I don't go if they have to go. If they want to go on fourth down as many times as they have to. They have to win this game. This game, I know it's crazy, Johnny. It's a must win for Daniel Jones, for Brian Dable, for everybody. It's, they cannot lose this game. If they lose this game, man, it can go south pretty quickly. Well, Wilson, so, look, I, I, I think they have to play really well. And I know okay. winning and losing is what matters. Uh, but right. I, I I don't know what you think. I don't know what you think, Matt. But I think you look at these two teams, you stack up their rosters. I mean, right. coin flip this game. I don't think there's a whole ton celebrating, uh, celebrating, differentiating uh, the rosters of these two teams. So, look, this game, Wilson, isn't going to come down to which team settles for field goals in the red zone versus touchdowns, right? Which team th- throws a you know, ill-timed interception or, or fumbles a punt. And by the way, I feel better about Daniel Jones than I do about Sam Darnold in terms of con- uh, protecting the football. So that those are the little things, Wilson, that this is going to come down to. Is it very important based on the schedule for the Giants to walk out of this game with a win? I think it is, but I think the call week one a must win is probably well, a little know, bit strong. I know, Johnny, but listen, this is – but, this, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it differently. If – a much more important game to the Giants than to the Vikings. The Vikings. Okay, that's fair. I'll eight. buy that. Okay. okay. Is that fair? To yeah, say? I think that's that, fair. That if you're gonna if you're gonna put it if you're gonna put uh, if you're gonna weigh it, it, it it holds a lot more water for the Giants and it's for the, if the Vikings lose. This is another game, but if the Giants lose, you know the whole it, it, it could really it could really go different south quickly. Okay, I, that's what I think. I don't know, but. Anyway, another thing is another thing is Johnny. Listen, I, I know. Hopefully, I know. I don't want to tell you how to how you do the job, but but hopefully, 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 uh, I don't have to hear every week that Tommy DeVito or or, or Drew Locke, and last year uh, it was Tyra Taylor that these guys are better than Daniel Jones. I, I mean, I, I, if I have to hear that every every week from some callers, I'm just gonna throw the, my TV out the window because. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just happy I, you're listen, watching I us know, on I, TV. I know you don't like. I, what? <laughs> I don't know. Go well, ahead, Wilson. I'm sorry. No, I'm just saying. I'm, no, no, Matt. Let me just. Uh, 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 I'm just saying that uh, uh, I know you don't. You know, you know, you, you don't have to like somebody. You know, like I, like personally, you guys know that I, I don't think Brian Day was a good head coach to me, but I don't bring it up every week. You know, no, you I'm don't. That's true. You're right about that. You don't. You don't hammer. I, I, I'm with I, you. I, no, because fair. it is what it is. You know, that's uh, it is what it is. If if I ever feel that I have to, maybe once. Because something was outrageous, then I'll bring it up. But, but because it goes beyond funny to just like moronic. I mean, to, to hear that Tommy DeVito is better than Daniel Jones and to actually believe it, 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 it it's, it's not funny anymore. You know, it's just, it's just I, mean, I mean, what are we doing? So I hope, Johnny, that, uh, like I said, I, I mean, I, you do a great job. I'm just saying that hopefully we don't have to hear it over and over and over. Because it, it, it's going to get old pretty quickly. You know what I'm saying? Wilson, appreciate the call, and you know my policy. Right, I, I will take calls. I do not tell the callers what to say. They are free to come with their own opinions. If we disagree with them, we will vociferously disagree with them, depending on how strongly we feel about it. Um, I still think we should just have Charlie and Wilson on the air at the same time. I was going to say, have, we could just leave the room. That was Pearson <laughs> very much like a not direct attack, but it was definitely like, like non-direct warfare going on there between <laughs> Wilson and Charlie. Yeah, <laughs> you're not wrong. That was and like a I mean, cyber attack. That, that's what that was. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, to what Wilson said, I mean, you and I have spoken for months now. Anytime that this topic comes up, 
we've been on the same page. Like Daniel Jones or not, he is the most talented quarterback on this team right now. And I frankly don't think it's very close. That was a, so, that was a little unconventional warfare right there between Wilson and Charlie. <laughs> a little so, indirect conflict. So, Wilson, the two of us agree. But as John said, we can't help what other people call in. And, 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 and we like people calling in with their opinions. So, uh, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, look, he's the quarterback, guys. Like, accept it. Like, that's where we're at. You might not be happy about it. And I understand and respect your opinion. But he's been clearly the best quarterback all off season, not even close. When he was just doing seven on sevens in the spring, he was the best quarterback based on what he was doing. So, just keep that in mind moving forward. And I get your frustration. You're more than welcome to call. I'm never going to tell you that that you can't express your opinion. Um, and that's kind of where we're at here. All right, let's go to Vinny in Florida, Pearson. He's up next. Vinny, what's up? Hey guys, long time to speak. Hey Vinny, hey. what's up, Vin? Hey, I have been thinking. I got a couple of questions about the offense. I've been thinking the last couple of of nights as I go to bed. This is going to be a really different team when we talk offensively. And and you guys, I listen to you guys as much as I can, have set the expectation that the offensive line is going to be much improved. However, it's not going to be a top-tier offensive line. So in thinking that, I'm saying to myself, well, does that mean possibly three sacks in a game? Or two sacks in a game. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you know, Vinny, we talked about this, and I'm not sure. I think I put this in the over-unders, or, or maybe it was in the fact of fictions we didn't get to. That's possible. I think I put the over-under, more or less, for the Giants' sacks allowed this year at 45, which would okay. be somewhere between two or three a game. If you, you know, 17 games, 45 yeah, sacks, that yeah. comes out to like 2.65 or something like that. Yeah. And does that give them time to go four wide receiver sets, go five wide receivers yet sets. I mean, I think that's the goal, man. One. That's the goal. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how exciting is this going to get? And before I ask you to answer it, I just wanted to say, that was Wilson. That was your best call, buddy, that I've ever heard. <laughs> <on the side. laughs> and and it was the most intelligent that I didn't say, what is going on? <laughs> Very good aspect. I, I loved it. Wilson is so. Wilson got a season off to a strong start today. He really did. Yeah, that yeah. was a and strong start to the season by Wilson. We appreciate that, Wilson. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so as I lay in bed last night, I'm saying, hey, we, Saquon Barkley is not here. He's the enemy now. He's on the Eagles. Sure. But, you know, are we? can we expect 100 yards out of, out of uh, a combined team? You know, can we expect that if we get a 10-point lead, we can run the ball? And these are things I don't know, but I I tell you I would get real pumped up if this was a four receiver set at times, five receiver set at times, and we see you know Bryce Ford Wheaton on the field with you know hey, uh, Slayton and and neighbors and and high. I mean this is, it could be exciting if I get time. Vinny, I don't know about five. But I think yeah, you I think you will see four, and rather than four with Bryce Ford Wheaton. Maybe four with Theo Johnson, or four with right. Ty- or four with maybe they have Tyrone Tracy in the backfield who used to be a wide receiver and you motion him out so you go five wide, but you have the running back there as an option to help in pass protection. If the front shows you something where you need the extra pass protector, then you can kind of motion him back into the backfield as a pass protector. So I think Matt, things like that are probably a lot more possible given where the strengths of this roster are. Yeah, I think that you're 100 percent right, and just. Toward, Vinny, just towards your you know question or your point about the run game, you know if there's a ten point lead, they brought Devin Singletary in for a reason. Brian Dable has spoken many times about how familiar he is with Devin Singletary as a player. They overlapped in Buffalo for three years, I believe. Sounds right. Three, four years. Mm-hmm. He knows him, and they went out and signed him on the first day of free agency. If you look at his numbers, he's averaged four point six yards per carry in his career. And not all those seasons okay. were behind, you know, the best offensive lines. Yeah, I will say this. I don't think, Vinny, and Matt, I'm sure you'll agree, this will not be as explosive of a running game that you had with Saquon where you can, you know, break right. a long one. You know, you remember, Devin yeah. Singletary yeah. ran in the four sixes. That's why he dropped where he did in the draft. He's not a top okay. speed burner, but he's low to the ground. He's got good vision. He's quick. He can make guys miss, and he's got good contact balance. So I think this, yeah. uh, this run game should be steadier. Then it's been over the last couple years, even though it might not be as explosive. Yeah, and you know, I, when I the mean, Giants year, when the Giants get into short yardage situations, whether it's you know second and one, third and one, or goal line situations, I'm very confident in Devin Singletary's ability 
to get, you know, that couple of yards to get the first down or get the touchdown. And he's so low to the ground. That helps. Yeah. Go ahead, Vin. Yeah, well, I hope so. Because last year, even with Barker, I mean, we couldn't gain a yard if we needed it because there's just no push on the offensive line. And I'm curious, are we going to see Evan Neal as a tight end? Um, you know, in some short yardage packages, are we going to see that new rookie that just made the team that I heard was a fullback last year? Are we going to go in power formations where we can just – impose our will uh, for lack of a better word on a team you know when you're got fourth and one or third and one or whatever yeah i mean it's it's entirely and i can take that off the air you guys are awesome i appreciate you guys thank you Vinny. uh yeah i mean it's entirely possible we've seen since brian dable took over as head coach there are times where you know when it's a short yardage situation they bring in an offensive lineman as you know that that six offensive lineman or an extra tight end to help block and help push the line of scrimmage to gain that one or two yards. What? No, I was talking about it. Sorry. I didn't, mean to, I, <laughs> no. I, I didn't mean to freak you out there. No, no, it's all good. Hey, Bob, I, I'm going to send it to the printer for you, okay? No problem. I'm trying to produce another interview while I'm doing this show. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. I didn't mean to distract you. No, no, all good. But, yeah, <laughs> I, I think, you know, we don't know this for sure, but I would not be surprised at all if, you know, Evan Neal or one of the other backup offense linemen are brought in as, like, a six offense lineman, a second tight end in running situations where they need to pick up one or two yards on the ground. We've seen it before in the last couple of years, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't happen again. So, yeah, we might see Evan Neal in situations like that. Yep, and, you know, maybe it's Stinney, and you slide one of the tackles out, right, to be the last guy in the line, and, you know, Stinney acts as, like, the interior guy, and then the Luminor or Andrew Thomas, you know, I guess they would technically be the extra – tight end because of the last guy in the line even though they're not the sixth offensive lineman so they could work those formations in uh in different ways plus the giants you know brought back he's now on the practice squad but Jakob johnson our guy that we both love who is you know fullback slash tight end and you know we'll have to see if he ends up getting elevated for game day this week or you know any week but if he is, I fully would expect him to be on the field in situations like that as an extra blocker. You are very invested in Jakob Johnson. I like Jakob jo I like having a fullback. <laughs> He's definitely I one of your guys. I miss the days of like Henry Hynoski, Jim Finn. No, I like my, my fullbacks. No Madison Hedgecock reference? Oh, Madison Hedgecock wow. as well. You, you forgot Madison. <laughs> he would not be very happy with you. Henry Hynoski? Hino the Rhino. Come on, of course. I'm with I, you. I, I just I miss I miss the days of fullbacks. Yeah, it's a dying breed, man. You don't have many Kyle Ustricks running around anymore. It's just, you know. Mike Allstotts? Yeah, and uh who's the who's the big three hundred pound fullback for the for the Ravens? That name I can't think of. He was a converted offensive lineman. Um, that and, and he's still there is their fullback. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, his, I can't remember his damn name, but he's a hell of a player. Uh, let's oh, and go. it just came out the Chargers to have one of their backup defense alignments. Some 290, 300 pound guy is now listed as their starting fullback Ooh, as well. I like that. <laughs> Patrick Ricard. Patrick Ricard. Yeah. Thank you. That's exactly who yeah. it is. And who, I'm surprised you haven't been the put Elijah Chapman at fullback bandwagon. I mean, if Jakob Johnson wasn't on this team, maybe, maybe I would be. All right. Well, I think you should try to get that bandwagon going before it happens. Otherwise, I'm, <laughs> otherwise I'm going to call you a bandwagon jumper. I need, I need you to be the pilot of that wagon. <laughs> you love the baby bison. I do love the baby bison. What if you had to choose between Baby Bison and Jakob Johnson? Then what would you do? Oh, that's that's a tough decision. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to have to make that decision. I love it. <laughs> Let's go to Tim in Charleston. He's up next. Hey, Tim, what's going on, man? Hey, guys, good to talk to you. I got three things. I'll go through them as quickly as possible. The last one's going to be the game. Yes, sir. With a couple of ancillary comments. But the second one's going to be Cyber Attack 2. And the first one, John, did you get a chance to look, <laughs> did you get a chance to look at that email, John? Tim, I have been like all over the place this week. I will wh all right. while you're this making is... your points, I'm going to look at it. Okay, how about that? All right, and 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 forward it to Matt since he's mentioned it. I think two, maybe three times. But let him read it and get your his feedback. But anyway, we'll move on from there. Matt has so told me thing, not to this... send him any of your emails. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't true. believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Then, then why? Then why did he like me on Facebook dating? Oh, um, gee, oh my God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and we've but, gone too far. Go ahead, Tim. What are your okay. points on the game? But anyhow, so I was going to say this regardless of Wilson's comment, but thank you, Wilson. Is The thing I was going to say is I'm just tired of everybody piling on Daniel Jones. I mean, Giants fans I'm talking about, you know, and, and even personally running into them. And there are a lot of them down here. But um, the thing, this is what I'll say. I always ask him, what do you think of Phil Simms? 
And they're like, oh, I love Phil Sims. Yeah, you love Phil Sims. Well, what was his, what was his first really good season? It was his season six, 1984, his breakout year when he threw for 4,000 yards. And that's when Phil Sims became Phil Sims. And so, you know, this is his – now, and we like – you know, it is what it is. It'll be what it's going to be, and that's all I'll say. But, you know, for our little friend in Maine, ask him, ask him next time he has something to say what he thinks of Phil Sims because he would have dumped Phil Sims the way he wants to dump DJ. So I'm going to just leave that where it is. We are very much um, in a Beetlejuice situation right now, by the way. Way too many people have mentioned Charlie's name. Like, <laughs> Pearson, he's, he's going I, to I call. I, just never, I never mention his name. I say our little friend in Maine. <laughs> I, know. I know. So so anyway, so to the season, you know, obviously, yes, this game is huge. Um, you know, and to the last caller, uh, I hope the Giants do get some 10-point leads so that we find out if they run the ball. I want to point out a couple of things. One, John, I was the one who started the Elijah Chapman at fullback. No, you're right. You did. You. You're right. No, you did. Yeah, that, 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 that is fair. So, that is fair. So, Matt, you should definitely look into it. You can call the other, the, I will. The other name I'll, I'll throw to Matt because it was before his time. I'm sure he knows the name Maurice Carthon. Um, of course. <clears throat> but, you know, this – and so, you know, I want to see Dex go to town on the center and put, push the pocket up the middle and let the edges clean up. Um, so, you know, and, and, and then I, 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 the weather's going to be great. I think it's high as 71 for Sunday. Chance of rain, uh, though, apparently, is my understanding. Like, a really, like, yeah, it's like, it's like um, 20. Somebody told me today it was like 20 to 25%. I yeah, don't look at the that, weather because just, I don't trust it, so. That's a one in four chance it's going to rain at some point that day. That's all. Okay. But anyway, so, so, I'm, so going on, going from there is, you know, the other thing is. Did it move I up am, to Saturday, the rain, maybe? Yeah. It moved, moved up to Saturday? Looks okay, like it. Got it. Yeah. So, so, you know, so the, definitely, I mean, as close to a must win as a game one can be. But, but the thing I'll say is, um, I, again, you know, my, my bold prediction on Daniel, I'm sticking to that, all, all, all in on that. And uh, I want to see, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so, I really also can't wait for game four against Dallas at home. I also can't wait to see the uniforms this week. But I want to see Dexter Lawrence manhandle Cooper Bibby. Bebby or BB or whatever the hell his name is, a rookie center. I want to see him get manhandled. Well, that'll be week four. That's week four you're talking about, right? Week four. Week yeah, four. Week yeah, four yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Dex is going to manhandle everybody under 300 pounds, so that's he, easy. Let's be honest, Tim. He manhandles people over 300 pounds, under 300 pounds. And he two, manhandles and everybody. 200, three, and, yes, and he correct. manhandles two 300-pounders sometimes. Correct. You know, so, so, uh, so, so I just wanted to mention those things. I think I had another point, but it slipped my aging brain. And um, and let's just go Giants, win by eight. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate the call. He brought right. up, you know, Dexter. Obviously, the last two seasons, Dexter Lawrence has been one of the best, if not the best, interior defensive lineman in the league. But the moment I truly, I guess, realized just how much of a force he was in the interior, and I will never forget this, that game against the Colts two years ago, when he literally just pushed over Quinton Nelson, who was one of the best guards in the NFL for years now. Put him right on his back. Literally put him on his back with one hand and then grabbed Nick Foles with the other and brought him down for a sack. Unbelievable. Play. One of the most impressive sacks I've seen from an interior lineman ever. Pearson, you can screen another one or two. We got time here. Let's go to Aiden in New Jersey. He's up next. Hi, Aiden. Hey, how's it going? What's up, buddy? What's up? Hey, uh, I'd like to make some predictions before I get into my point. Sure, That's go ahead. Cool. What do you got? Okay, so, so I have three. I first, I say Malik Neighbors is to uh, break uh, Saquon's uh, rookie record of per reception. Okay, that's a good one. I think yeah, he, well, I, Saquon yeah, was what, like nine, was he ninety one? Ninety one was it? Ninety one. Yeah. yeah, I think he has a better chance because uh, back then it was sixteen games. No, I. I I, also, I, Saquon I, tied I o, shot there. Saquon tied Odell for the record. Oh, so they're tied in 90, 91. Okay, yeah. good but o, Odell only it's did it in Odell. 12 games. Yeah, but Odell did it in 12 games, which is that even is more crazy. impressive. But, that is crazy, but yes, yeah, that is the rookie after. record. And I, I imagine I imagine Odell holds the rookie yardage record, correct? He must. I, he, yeah, he has to. Yeah, exactly. I, I think Malik Nambus could break that as well. What is that I'll record? Do, uh, uh, do you know if Aiden what the rookie receiving yard record is? Not offhand. No. What do you got, Matt? Odell had thirteen hundred and five yards in twelve games. In twelve games, that's I'm that has that has to be the, the Giants' oh rookie God. record. God, that, that's insane. That is insane. Twelve games, right? Yep, twelve games. Wow. 
Okay. And what? And by the okay. way, he only played like half the snaps in the first game versus Atlanta too that year. He didn't even play the full game. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he, he actually had a touchdown in that game too. Well, it's because the last four, yeah. the last four weeks yeah. of the season, the lowest yardage he had he was a hundred and thirty. <laughs> And he had a three touchdown game, a two touchdown game, seven touchdowns right. in the last four right. weeks. The yes. Dallas game, the Rams won. I know three against Washington. Yeah, just crazy. That is that, that is wild. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing quick math. That's 118 yards per game. Doing quick math in my head, something like that. I think maybe last year, probably a little more than that actually. Maybe 100. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, uh, Aiden, what's your what, what else you got? Oh, my other two, I'm going to go with, um, this one's a little bold. I'm going to say uh, Tyler Newbin is going to break the uh, rookie pick six record. I saw it tied uh, with three players, had three. I'm going to say he gets four. Pick sixes? Yeah. Okay. How about the rookie interception record in general? Are you just focusing on the pick sixes here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pick sixes I, in general. I'm not sure. I, was, I looked up giant. Uh, for Giants all time, it's eight. I say that that's just too hot, hard to break. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. I like it, Aiden. These are pretty bold. All right. Yeah, and then the last one, I'm gonna go. With, I'm gonna say Daniel Jones sets his career high in passing touchdown. He had 24 his rookie year. If he can get over 24 this year, I think that would be a very successful season. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, what's and your point then, on the game, Aiden? Uh, oh, oh yeah. Um. um well, if I want to talk about, like, Brian Dable and the coaching staff. I feel like I want to know what guys think because, like, obviously year one he exceeded expectations. The last year was down and then, I mean, th- this year it's year three. I was wondering, like, how much uh, pressure do you think on him and the coaching staff going into this year? And obviously last year there were a few games that, weren't managed as well and the Giants should have won and yeah I want to know your thoughts on that thank you Aiden appreciate the call thank uh, you, Aiden. look I, I know a lot of people were talking hot seat and stuff like that guys John Mara hates changing coaches like he does not want to change coaches every two years uh, I think there is a belief in Brian Dable that he's a good coach he did win coach of the year two years ago uh, I think there's belief that he's a very good offensive coach as well and then that he's taken over play calling duties if the offense takes a big jump, I think that, that plays a huge factor in all this too. I think they hope that they can pair Brian Dable with Joe Shane for a very long time here as the head coach and GM and let them build this thing together. Adam Schefter always puts this out every year. The Giants have the second youngest roster in football, and they have the youngest starting 24 or 22, sorry, in football. So this is a young team, guys. They want this group to be able to grow together under the same system. Like That's what they want to see. So, uh, look, there's pressure every year. Brian Dable wants to win games. He, he's very competitive. He feels pressure no matter what. I would not be talking about any of that sort of stuff, uh, especially this early in the year. I, I think I think the hope here is, Matt, that these both those guys, Joe Shane and Brian Dable, will be here for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I think that is very obvious that that is the hope. Obviously, you know, you never know what could happen, but that was clear when they were both brought in two years ago that – because of how familiar they were and how close they were at Buffalo, that the hope was that the two of them would be here for, as you said, a very long time. And quite honestly, like I know how how poorly last season went. I I don't think that original plan has changed, at least not as of right now. No, I'm with you. All right, we said his name too many times. <laughs> I knew that I, I saw that thing flash in Pearson. I knew it was him. I felt like Luke Skywalker. You know what I mean? Just like. <laughs> hearing the Obi-Wan Kenobi voice while I'm flying the X-Wing, and I just knew it was him, except Charlie is no Obi-Wan Kenobi. Charlie, what's going on, man? Hey, hey, guys. Look, you mentioned my name. I got a call. Well, Charlie, I mean, I mean, I mean look, you, you have skirmishers at your border. They've sent irregulars over to, like, sabotage your power plants, cyber attacks. How are you going to respond to this, my friend? I didn't even hear what he said, to tell you the truth. So, it's shocking you weren't I'll, listening. I'll I listen, can't believe it. I'll have to listen to the archive. No, because I was trying to get on. It took oh, me forever to get you. on. I got you. <clears throat> hey, Good Matt, job screening this call out, Pearson. Well done. Matt, yep. Matt, I don't understand why you're on the show. You have hair. 
Everybody else's <laughs> balls are almost bald. Ooh. I'm telling you, I don't know why they let you on, now, but you better wear a skull cap next time. They were well, trying to bring down the age. It. They were trying to bring down the age demo, wow. the age average. So we got hair <laughs> shots and old shots. First of all, be careful telling Detino he doesn't have any hair left. I think he would take offense to that first of all. He doesn't have much. I, he doesn't have much. I'm not making any that. comments on that, Charlie, but be very careful. I, I think Paul is pretty proud of what he has left. I'm obviously not going to throw stone in glass yeah, houses here. Last, but remember, we, remember, we yeah, unfortunately lost Lance this offseason. We need to have yeah, some well, hair to replace him. He was losing hair, too, on the side. <laughs> oh, you know, man, you were just, jeez. <laughs> and you, Paul's got half a head. He's got half his head as bald, the other half. He's you're just taking head. shots at everybody. We, we, these aren't even the people that said anything mean about you when you're taking shots at them. <laughs> this is why you held for so long on the line? And by the way, I, I will, I no, will no, point no, out, no, no. Pearson probably, Pearson has a fine head of hair on him. So I will just I point that out to I know yes. he did. He's from New England. I knew he did. What, there are no, <laughs> there are no bald people in Boston? What are you talking about? <laughs> we really need to get a Pearson cam set up. I think we do need a Pearson cam. It's I necessary. agree with that. Now, yeah. uh, 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 Troy, here, here, here's the game, by the way. Go through yeah. some of like these giant videos. You can even look at maybe some of the Eli Manning show stuff. See if you can spot who you think Pearson is in the background based on what you know right. about his New England heritage. And I want you to call <laughs> next time. I want you to get back to us, okay? All right. I'll do that. Hey, look, I got a couple of things. Yes. <clears throat> One thing is the Giants never win when they're celebrating anything. They didn't win when they were celebrating Strahan. They didn't win when they were celebrating Sims. In fact, we lost 35 to nothing. We didn't win when we celebrated the 2007 team. We didn't win when we celebrated the 2011 Charlie, team. Charlie, it's funny you bring this up. We had a right. similar conversation before while we were waiting for a press conference the other day, and Cytac had a better memory than I did. He found the game that stuck in his, his head that we did celebrate something, and it actually turned out well. So... Give, give it to me. What do you got? Well, yes, it was what that. was that? It was the. No, no, no. It was the. <laughs> I want to make sure I get the year right. I believe it was 20, yeah. 2014. 14, I think you said, right? The Giants played. Oh, 2016. Sorry. The Giants played the Bengals on a Monday night game, and they inducted several members to the Ring of Honor. Coach Coughlin, Justin Tuck, Chris Ernie, Ernie Acorsi. 2016, Sweet. Monday night, Giants won the game. 21-20, <clears throat> right? If I remember the, the, the uh, score you told me, I think. That that I remember. Yes. I think it was twenty one. Twenty one to twenty. All right. Andy Dalton. One game out of a hundred. Just saying, don't say never. Oh, by the way, Charlie, how about this? How about this? does this mean something? Right. Oh, the quarterback. Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> so you have you have the ceremony, the ginger factor. Maybe it's all turning around here, Charlie. Who knows? Uh, hey look, and we you know the last time we won an opening day game at home? 2011. That is correct. 2011. I'm aware. I'm you don't have to tell me, Charlie. I know. Yeah. You know what's going to happen? There's going to be booze at halftime. Actually, I think it was 2000. I think it was 2010, actually. I don't think it was 2011. Well, but anyway. It's either 11 or 10. Yeah. And they're going to be booing at halftime. Oh, Charlie, why be, do you say that? Because Jones is going to stink it up. He's going to have at least two turnovers in the first half. They're going to be booing, throwing their Pepsi on know, the field. You know, and Sam, you know Sam Darnold... <laughs> Sam Darnold turns the ball over far more than Daniel Jones does, my friend. You know that. Not in this, not in this offense, because he's going to throw the ball quickly and get it out quick on short routes. He will not do that. I'm telling you, we're going to lose this game because we always lose when we celebrate, except for one out of a hundred. <laughs> and the thing is, is like, why do you sound look, happy about it, Charlie? That's what I want. Why, why do you? Why do you sound no, excited you know, about this proposition? That's what I want to know. Because it's like Saturday Night Live. For God's sakes, Gomer Jones is a horrible quarterback. You can just because he's got a beard now, he's not going to change. It's Eli Manning. Your Sorry. calls, Charlie. Your calls sometimes are like Saturday Night Live, Charlie. Except it's not like the first skit, which is usually good. It's like you get to twelve forty-five and you're half asleep, and it's the last skit that made the show. And you get through, and you're like, boy, they really didn't think this one through too much, did it? It's cut for time. <laughs> yeah, correct. No, it's when they just got it under the clock, and they're like, all right, I oh, guess yeah, well. we, we're not really a big fan of this skit but we have 10 minutes to fill before the musical guest comes on for the second time. <laughs> so I guess we'll slide it in. Okay. Look, look all I'm saying is we are going to lose against Minnesota the first game at home, 100-year anniversary, the whole nine yards, and we're going to lose. 
and I don't think it's even going to be close. I think they're going to beat us by at least. Uh, you have to say something nice about the team before you hang up. Okay, something nice about the team. I'll say something nice about uh, neighbors. Uh, Hyatt, I like those two guys. Cytax hair. He said something nice about that already. That's, That's true. true. Offensive line, though, guys. You know, PFF. You know what they had us in the offensive line this year? Twenty-eight. You know what we were last year? Thirty-second. We moved up three big spots. Troy, that's so, a, that that that. First of all, it's, it, first of all, it's four spots for the Beth majors out there. If you go from thirty-two, well, to 30, whatever. Four. Um, but, wow, wow, that's gonna Troy, make a difference, right, that, John? That that's a projection. And again, I'm not telling you the team that's yeah, gonna have a I, top twelve offensive right. line, but it, but if they if they finish as like the twenty-second offensive line in, in, in the league, that's an offensive line that you can run your full offense behind, and that's all you're yeah, looking for. And I'm also glad you brought up the PFF line ranking specifically because, as yeah. as you know, I, I do check PFF often, and that ranking has bothered me for a while now because if you look back <laughs> at what at the grades that they gave Jermaine Illuminor and Greg Van Roden last year, it does not line up with how they're projecting them this year along with a healthy Andrew Thomas because both of those two new additions – got very good marks from PFF last year. They were in the 70s, right? So it makes no sense that having them two starters now with an all-pro left tackle, that that is still the 28th-ranked offensive line in the league. Maybe they think uh, Johnny Van Rotten is going to be the center. Maybe that's why. Johnny Van Rotten. Charlie, (laughs) thank you for the call. Oh, my. I was annoyed, by the way. ESPN put up their projections. They projected the Giants to have the worst offense in the league this I year. Did saw you that, that too. I saw that too. I don't understand that. How could you put them behind the Patriots? Everyone is doubting the Giants this I, year. I, I, look, I don't. I don't get that. I, I like to think I'm very realistic. That I don't. That to me, it's 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 really off the mark. I really think it's off the mark. I agree, and I don't even think it's you know us being a little too close to the situation. No, like I really I just, don't. I genuinely don't see how the Giants have the worst offense in the NFL no, with the I pieces would... that they now have. And look, if, if I end up being wrong, you guys can call up and call me a moron. That's fine. But Same I here. Would, I, I I just I don't I, with Brian Dable and all the the line better the, the weapons. Devin Singletary is a good player. Like I, I don't I don't get that. I just I don't get it. All right, Giants season tickets. You can still get them, folks. You're a couple days. You can still get in the door. Giants.com slash tickets, single game tickets too. Probably not for Sunday, but they're there. And then Giants TV, all of our great video content. Check it out. It's for free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, Fire TV, Giants mobile app. Matthew Saitak, good job, my friend. Thank you. Pearson Baller, excellent work. Saitak and Detino will have one more show tomorrow at 1230. And then again, Big Blue Kickoff Live on the weekend, 7 a.m. Marash and I on the fan. Check that out as well. And then our radio pregame show starts at 11 a.m., on Sunday locally here in New York. If you're on our radio network, it starts at noon. For our crew, I'm John Schmuck. We'll see you next time on Big Blue Kickoff Live.